In the last lecture, we took a closer look at plane group symmetry, which is the symmetry that can be used to describe two-dimensional repeating patterns like a two-dimensional crystal. In this lecture, we're going to extend those ideas into three dimensions, which of course is the dimensionality of the kinds of crystals that we encounter in the lab 99.9% .9 of the time. So in a very analogous manner to plane group symmetry, we're going to get space group symmetry by combining the translational symmetry of a Brave lattice with the point symmetry operations of a point group. The difference being that once we go to three dimensions, we have more Brave lattices and more point groups. The shear numbers are given on this slide. There are 14 Brave lattices in three dimensions and there are 32 crystallographic point groups. And when we combine those, we're going to end up with a total of 230 space groups that can be used to describe three-dimensional crystals. Now, if the math here looks not straightforward to you, there's a reason for that, and we'll see that as we go along. Just a reminder of the Brave lattices that we encounter in three dimensions. There are seven different shapes that we're going to encounter and various kinds of lattice centering. And so for some lattices, like the orthorhombic lattice, we could have a primitive orthorhombic lattice. We could have a base-centered orthorhombic lattice, which is represented by a C. We could have a body-centered orthorhombic lattice, represented by I. Or a face-centered orthorhombic lattice, which is represented by an F. For all of the other types of lattices, we have fewer choices of centering for reasons that were explained uh, back in lecture two when we looked at the properties of three-dimensional Brave lattices. So these are going to describe the translational symmetry of our three-dimensional space groups. Now our task is to combine these Brave lattices with the 32 crystallographic point groups. Remember that the number of point groups in crystallography is confined to be only those that contain twofold, threefold, fourfold, or sixfold rotation axes. Just as we saw in the two dimensional case, here in the three dimensional case, we see that each point group is exclusively tied with one of the Brave lattices. So, for example, if we were talking about orthorhombic space groups, you know, which we just saw had four different Brave lattices, we see that there are three point groups that go with the orthorhombic lattice, 222, 2mm, and mmm. Now it's probably worth reviewing the required symmetry elements that go along with each crystal system. Here the crystal system is a term I use to encompass the primitive Brave lattice plus the various types of centered Brave lattices that go with that crystal system. Triclinic is kind of like oblique. There's no required symmetry elements. And in fact, the only symmetry element that would be allowed, other than the identity, would be the inversion. Then we have the monoclinic crystal system. And in the monoclinic crystal system, you can have a twofold rotation axis, or you can have a mirror plane, or you can have a twofold rotation axis with a parallel mirror plane. So only three point groups. We talked about the orthorhombic already. The orthorhombic is going to have in uh, the three Cartesian directions, either a mirror plane or a twofold rotation axis or both in each of those directions, but no higher rotation axes than twofold. And then the others all correspond to symmetries that result when we have higher order rotation axes. In two dimensions, we didn't really differentiate between those point groups that have sixfold rotation axes and those that have threefold rotation axes. But we will do so in the three dimensional case. If the highest order rotation axis is a threefold rotation axis, then the symmetry is said to be trigonal. Whereas if the highest order rotation axis is a sixfold axis, then the symmetry is said to be hexagonal. Now keep in mind, in a hexagonal point group, we might also have, and generally we will have, threefold axes. Then we have the tetragonal case, where we have uh, a fourfold rotation axis. 
And then we have uh, the highest symmetry option, which would be the cubic lattice. And here, the defining symmetry element are threefold axes that run along the body diagonal of the cube. It's worth noting that in a cubic crystal system, we don't have to have a fourfold rotation axis, although a fourfold rotation axis is permitted. And then if you're a little bit confused about the difference between cubic and trigonal, the distinction is that in a trigonal point group or a trigonal space group, the threefold axes will all be parallel to one another. Whereas in a cubic space group, the threefold axes are intersecting. They run along the body diagonals of the cube. So let's now see how we can take these point groups and these Brave lattices and combine them to get space groups. And we're going to do this for all of the monoclinic space groups. So in the monoclinic crystal system, we have two Brave lattices. We have a primitive monoclinic lattice and a base-centered monoclinic lattice. And, as we just saw, there are three possible point groups. 2, m, and 2 over m. So, if we combine those, let's see what kind of space groups we can get. It should be pretty apparent that we can readily generate six different space groups by combining these two types of lattices and these three types of point groups. P2, PM, P2 over M, and then C2, CM, and C2 over M. The upper three are derived from the primitive monoclinic lattice, and the lower three from the base-centered monoclinic lattice. These six space groups are called the somorphic space groups. And the reason why is because they don't contain any travel symmetry elements. They don't contain screw axes or glide planes. But we can get additional monoclinic point groups if we consider these travel symmetry operations. How would that work? We're going to, for example, replace the two-fold rotation axis with a two-sub-one screw. Okay, that would be a non-somorphic space group because now we have a presence of a screw axis. Okay, but the point group is technically still two. We could, in a similar way, replace the mirror plane with a glide plane, and that glide plane would be a C-glide. And we could replace in P2 over M, we could have P2 over C, you know, replacing the mirror with a glide, P2 sub 1 over M, where we replace the twofold with the 2 sub 1 screw, or P2 sub 1 over C, where we make both substitutions. And then it figures that we might get the same set of space groups with the base-centered monoclinic lattice. That would give us C2 sub 1, CC, C2 over C, C2 sub 1 over M, and C2 sub 1 over C. However, some of these space groups are not unique. If you look in the international tables, you will not find C2 sub 1, C2 sub 1 over M, or C2 sub 1 over C. And the reason why goes back to something we talked about when considering the centered rectangular lattice in the last lecture. That is, the combination of the lattice centering and a 2 sub 1 screw axis creates a two-fold rotation axis. So if you have a base-centered monoclinic lattice and you have, for example, a 2 sub 1 screw that's parallel to the B axis, which is the direction it would run by convention, the combination of the C-centering and the 2 sub 1 screw creates two-fold rotation axes that are also running parallel to B. So you can't have the 2 sub 1 without the 2. And because of that, the space group C2 sub 1 and the space group C2 are one and the same. And the name that we use for that space group is C2. Okay, so when we put these both together, we see that we have a total of 13 monoclinic space groups. Six that are shown over here, which we call the somorphic space groups because they don't contain glide planes or screw axes. And then seven non-somorphic space groups, which are shown over here. And that's it. Now let's turn our attention to a very useful resource for anybody who's doing crystallography and that is the International Tables for Crystallography, Volume A. There are many volumes of the International Tables, but here we're going to focus on Volume A.
this contains all of the information we would need to know about these 230 space groups. It also contains the information about the playing groups we talked about in the last lecture. Here at Ohio State University, we can access this through the library, which is what I would recommend, and here is the link that you need to go to to find it. Let's take a look at what we can find when we go to the International Tables for Crystallography. We're going to highlight this with the example of the P2 sub 1 over C space group. This is one of the most commonly encountered space groups of all 230. Now, in the printed edition of the book, you will find two pages for this space group. And so let's talk about what we see on both pages in turn. So if we start with page one, there's a bunch of information, and let's see what all of these things tell us. Well, first of all, we see the name of the space group in Herman Mogwit, P2 sub 1 over C. P2 sub 1 over C is actually the shortened or abbreviated name of this space group. The long name would be P1, 2 sub 1 over C, 1, with those two ones telling us about the symmetry elements along the A and C uh, directions. But in all monoclinic systems, those are always one, so that's why we drop it. There is also the Schoenflies name for the space group, which is not much used because it's really a very limited utility. In that case, you just take the point group, C2H, and every time you encounter a new space group that has C2H point group symmetry, we, we increase the number of this superscript. So this is the fifth space group that has C2H symmetry. Although you find this in the international tables, I have never seen it used anywhere else. We also see the crystal system here, and then we see the point group. And the point group here is 2 over m. Right? So this space group comes out of combining the 2 over m point group and the primitive monoclinic Brave lattice. Notice when we look at the point group, because one of the skills you want to have is identifying the point group from the name of the space group. Although it might seem a little confusing at first, it's in fact a very easy thing to do. We just need to turn all of the screw axes into rotation axes and all of the glide planes into mirrors. So 2 sub 1 over C, if we replace the 2 sub 1 with a 2 and we replace the C with an M, then we get the point group, 2 over M. Now let's look at these drawings a little bit closer. For a monoclinic space group, we're going to see sort of four representations here. The diagram in the lower right gives us information about the equivalent positions. We'll come back to that at the end. But now let's focus on these other three drawings. So this is basically just a schematic of all of the symmetry elements in the unit cell. So let's look for those. Now we see from, just from the name, we know that there should be a 2 sub 1 screw axis. It is parallel to the B axis. That's the standard convention for a monoclinic crystal. And then we have a perpendicular C glide. Okay, now if we look at the very bottom, we see mathematical representations of the various symmetry operations in this space group. So let's start with this one. Two parentheses, 0, 1, half, 0. So when you see a number, then followed by three coordinates in parentheses, that's how we represent a screw axis. The 2 tells us that this is a two-fold screw axis, and the 0, 1, half, 0, that's the translation vector. So we're going to rotate by 180, and we're going to translate by 1 half unit cell in the B direction. Uh, this last part here, 0, y, 1 quarter, that tells us where the axis is located in the unit cell. So because it's parallel to the B axis, it doesn't really have a specific location in B. That's why we just use y. But if we were to look at a projection in the AC plane, we would see it should intersect the unit cell at 0, 1 quarter. So where is that screw axis? Well, this image right here, is a projection in the AC plane, and we see at 0A, 1 quarter C, there's our screw axis, right? Remember, that's this hurricane-like symbol. And then when we add in all of the other symmetry elements of the group, we see that there are equivalent 2 sub 1 screw axes that are generated. So when we're looking down the axis, as we are here in the AC plane, it looks like a hurricane. 
when the screw axis is actually in the plane of the projection, as it is in this AB projection or in this BC projection, then we use a half arrow to designate a two sub one screw axis. Symmetry element number three is the inversion center. And the symbols for the inversion center are these small open circles, right? So we see that there's an inversion center at the corners of the unit cell, at the body center of the unit cell, uh, on e the midpoint of each edge of the unit cell. So those are our inversion centers. Symmetry element number four, C, right? So this is a C glide. And what's the location of the C glide? Well, X one quarter Z. So the only thing that's specified is this one quarter in the B direction. So that means it's one quarter of the unit cell upwards in B. And maybe that's most easily seen here, right? We see that there's a, here's a glide plane and it's gonna intersect the B axis at one quarter and at three quarters. Uh, we see that same glide plane here intersecting the B axis at one quarter and three quarters. We have different symbols for the glides. The dashed glide plane, remember that tells us that the translation is in the plane of the projection. And since this is a C glide, the translation is going to be vertical in this projection by one half unit cell. When we see the dotted line, it means that the translation part of the glide is going to be perpendicular to the plane of the projection. So here, the C direction is coming out at us, and so after we do the mirror, we would translate up out of the plane of the projection by one half unit cell. And then finally, in the AC projection, so the glide plane is perpendicular to the B axis, which means it's in the AC projection. In that case, it is symbolized by this thing we see up in the corner here. It is in the plane of this projection. We see a one quarter because it's one quarter of the way above the AC plane. And then the arrow tells us the direction of the translation. All right, so that's how we can find all of these symmetry elements. Now let's take just a minute to talk about this diagram that is in the lower right. Remember in the 2D plane groups, we saw that this is the way that we can show where the equivalent positions are. So let's just start by putting an atom here or some object here. The plus means that you know now we have to deal with the third dimension. And so the plus says, okay, this is sitting above the plane of this projection by some amount. Let's say plus y. Um, well, here's another equivalent point. That's going to be at this location, minus y now. That's what the minus means. And the comma means that it has the opposite handedness as the point here, because this one is related to this one by an inversion. Then we have you know, this point, which is translated up by one half unit cell. So it's one half plus y is its height above the plane. Uh, and why the one half plus y? Well, that's because of the action of this screw axis. Then we have another inversion here. So we get this point, which is uh, one half minus y above the plane of the projection and the opposite handedness, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see that there's one, two, three, four lattice points within the unit cell. So we expect the multiplicity of the general position to be four. All right, now let's look at the other page in the international tables. This gives, most importantly, the information about the various equivalent sites in the unit cell, the Wyckoff sites. So this is very much like we encountered in the two-dimensional case. So if we look at this general position, right? we just were talking about how the multiplicity of the general position should be four. So if you put an atom at an arbitrary place in this unit cell, you're going to get three symmetry equivalent atoms located at these coordinates. And you could work out how these coordinates are related using the symmetry operations we saw at the bottom of the last page. Then we have uh, the special Wyckoff sites which are given over here. In this particular space group, the special sites are those sites which are sitting on an inversion center. It may be worth noting that if we were to put an atom, let's say, on a screw axis, 
or on a glide plane. Those are both travel symmetry elements. Because they're travel symmetry elements, it's going to generate another atom somewhere else. Right? So if you put an atom on a screw axis and you operate with the screw axis, it does not map that atom back onto itself. It actually translates it up along the screw axis. And so because of that, we won't see special positions associated with putting atoms on travel symmetry elements. And finally, at the bottom, we have some useful information about how the symmetry might change. So we can first look at the maximal non-isomorphic subgroups. So these are different space groups that are related to this one by the loss of some point symmetry operation. So if we only keep point symmetry operations one and two, that's the identity and the two sub one screw, the space group would be lowered to P two sub one. If we only keep symmetry elements one and three, the identity and the inversion, the space group symmetry will be lowered to P one bar. And if we only keep symmetry operations one and four, the identity and the C glide, the symmetry would be lowered to PC. All right, so oftentimes, for example, when we encounter a phase transition or maybe a, a, a subtle distortion or even ordering of different atoms onto a given site, we might see that we have to lower the space group symmetry and then this information about uh, subgroups is very useful. We don't have any of the isomorphic subgroups 2A or 2B, but these come from changing or losing some translational symmetry. If this had been a base-centered monoclinic lattice, we could have lowered the translational symmetry to primitive monoclinic and kept the same point symmetry elements. And, and subgroups which arise from loss of translational symmetry are going to go in the either the 2A or the 2B. There's also information about these isomorphic subgroups of the lowest index. If you look at these, you'll see these are ones where we've made the unit cell bigger in some way. So we've, in essence, by making the unit cell bigger, it means we've lost translational symmetry. Uh, and then there's also uh, supergroups, and these would be space groups that have more symmetry. P2 sub 1 upon C is a non-isomorphic subgroup of these various space groups. Okay, let's finish by looking at an example. And what I want you to do is to use your knowledge of the symbolism of different symmetry elements to look at this representation of a space group and figure out what is the space group, the point group, and the crystal system uh, that goes with this diagram. I'll give you a couple hints before I stop the video and let you work it out. But notice that in all of the projections, we have right angles between the lattice vectors, right? So this is one of the crystal systems where the A, B, and C vectors are mutually perpendicular. And, and since all of these are basically rectangles, that kind of gives you a clue as to what the crystal system has to be. All right, I'm going to pause the video. Once you've got an answer to these questions, come back and we'll go through the answer. All right, well, I'm going to start by looking for symmetry elements. And so what do we see? Well, we've got a two sub one screw, I can see. And here, this is the AB projection, right? You see these, these small letters here. So that means that two sub one screw must be parallel to the C axis. OK, that's good to know. Uh, here is a mirror plane, right? This solid line right here is a mirror plane. And that's perpendicular to the A axis. Then I've got a glide plane right here that's perpendicular to B. So one of the things I can see now is because I've got a two sub one screw and then I've got perpendicular glides and or mirrors, that tells me that I'm in the orthorhombic crystal system, right? I can't be in a higher symmetry. There's no fourfold axes, threefold axes, sixfold axes. So we've got an orthorhombic space group here. Okay, for every space group, we start with a letter, and that letter tells us about the centering of the lattice. 
Here, we're told it's a primitive lattice, so the first letter is going to be a capital P. Then for an orthorhombic crystal system, we follow that with the symmetry operations associated with the A, B, and C axes. So the symmetry operation that's associated with the A axis is a mirror plane. The symmetry operation that's associated with the B axis is this glide plane that is perpendicular to B. Now we might want to work out what kind of glide is that. Well, there's different ways we might identify it, but it is a C glide. How can I tell? In this projection, I've got a dotted line, which means my translation is perpendicular to the plane of the projection. And what axis is perpendicular to the plane of this projection? The C axis. Over uh, in this image on the right, I've got this symbol, which is also the glide plane, and that tells me the translation part of the glide is in the direction of the arrow, and that happens to be along the c-axis. That is our symmetry element that we're going to associate with the b-axis. And then finally, for the c-axis, well, we've got this 2 sub 1 screw. Do we have any mirrors or glides that are perpendicular to the c? Well, if we look in this projection, here's the c-axis. I don't see anything perpendicular. If I come up to this projection and look along this direction, the c-axis, I don't see anything perpendicular. Okay, so I don't have any mirrors or glides perpendicular to c. And so that means the space group is p for primitive orthorhombic lattice, m, c, 2 sub 1. Okay, the mirror comes from this mirror perpendicular to a, the c comes from the c glide perpendicular to b, and the 2 sub 1 is the axis that's parallel to c. What point group is this? Well, we're going to change the glides to mirrors and the screws to rotation axis. So this is point group M, M2. And then, of course, this is the orthorhombic crystal system as we worked out. And if you go back to our table of space groups and Brave lattices, you'll see that when you have point group M, M2, you must have an orthorhombic lattice. All right, well, hopefully this is helpful, give you a little bit of an introduction to space groups and the international tables. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll go a little bit deeper and look at some of the other crystal systems.